Welcome to Everything Band, a podcast that features conversations with composers, conductors, and performers of music for winds and percussion. My name is Mark Connor. I'm a composer, and this is episode three. My guest for this episode is Matt Salvaggio. Hi, Matt. How are you doing, Mark? I'm doing well, thank you. I'd like to start by asking if you'd tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Sure. Um, so I'm the director of bands at Hiram College, which is a little liberal arts college um, just outside of Cleveland. Um, I'm also the music director of the University Heights Symphonic Band, which is a community band. And uh, I just started a 19th century historical performance orchestra in the city. Wow, that's that's awesome. So what um, do you have a string background or a wind background originally? I'm an oboe player by training. Oh, nice, nice. And so what prompted you to start the uh, historical ensemble? I know this is a podcast about winds and percussion, but this is fascinating. Sure. No, I when I was working for the Cleveland Pops Orchestra, I had a colleague um, who was trained as a tubist and um, had done some playing um, uh, with Serpent and Offa Clyde and Chimbasso. And we discovered that we had a love for the, the music of the 19th century. And uh, he thought, well, you know, why don't we get an orchestra together? And then uh, several years went by and we found ourselves uh, doing a gig together. And um, on the bus on the way to the gig, we started brainstorming and we thought, well, you know, what would it actually take? Who would we ask and what would we do and how would we set it up? And then it just kind of snowballed from there. That's awesome. You know, one of the things that I, I feel over my career is that personal connections have opened up almost all of the doors I've walked through. And so it's interesting that you, you talk about a colleague and how just discussions lead to new opportunities and new new projects. Yeah, it's I, I think everything from a professional standpoint that I have been so fortunate enough to have experienced so far has been uh, through somebody that I know or through a friend of a friend or, you know, some something similar to that. Right, right. Me too. So let's talk about you a little bit more. What's your, what's your origin story? So how did you get started as a musician? Uh, well, I started off as a flute player in elementary school and was fortunate uh, to have grown up in a time where we got private lessons in school and I got private lessons outside of school and so uh, it was a very um, it was a very uh, fortunate time um, because a lot of school programs now um, don't even get to start their band program I mean we started in fourth grade when I grew up and now you know Sometimes it's fifth grade, sometimes it's not until seventh or ninth grade in a lot of these districts. So uh, I feel very fortunate uh, to have grown up when I did. And then when I was in seventh grade, I decided to switch to the oboe. And it was uh, one of the best and worst decisions I ever made in my life. Because my teachers all said to me, well, you know, you could be a flute player we think you'd be really good at this and you'd get a lot of money to go to college if you turn out to be good. Uh-huh. And, um, I guess I was lucky enough that I stuck with it. <laughs> sure. Sure. I, you know, I, I have two small children and my wife is a cellist and I'm a trumpet player originally. And we always joke that, um, we don't want our children to be oboists or harpists. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, I, you know, I, it was, it was one of those things where, I met a very good teacher, and we had very good chemistry together, and the, the growth that I had from seventh grade through high school, mm-hmm. the, uh, I, I could not have asked for a better teacher. Um, and she, she let me do a lot, uh, just you know, from a musical standpoint, you know, I'd ask her, you know, well, what do you think about slowing down there or, or, you know, just different stylistic things. And she was very, very encouraging, you know, even if it wasn't necessarily the right quote unquote thing to do, um, you know, just giving me the opportunity to do it and to play around and, and be creative. I mean, I really couldn't have asked for anything better. Sure. Sure. Do you have any stories from back then? Do you remember anything specific? Oh my gosh, I remember I did the part of the Chimarosa uh, oboe concerto and 
it just you know there was there was a lot of playing around uh, you know with Tempe and things like that and you know looking back on it now and some of the recordings that I have you know I, it's like I would never do <laughs> some of the things that I did and you know uh, and as I'm teaching now I don't think that I would encourage my students to do what I did. But, you know, I think having the exposure of being able to try it, right. and even if it's, you know, now that I'm, I guess, smart enough to know better, um, I think, you know, having been able to go through it and try it and, you know, at least have the creative experience was really worthwhile in my opinion. Right. I think having that opportunity to fail or to succeed, or just to try things when you're young as a musician is really important. Is that where you first started to think about maybe conducting or, or getting into teaching? Was it through that experience? Well, my middle school band director was, I think, really, really influential, and I only got to have him for a year before he retired. Um, but he was kind of my first exposure to what a, a professional musician is and what conducting is and how conducting relates to music education and things like that. And, you know, I knew I wanted to teach for a long time, um, but it, it wasn't until I think middle school where I really kind of started to feel that maybe music education and conducting was going to be the right uh, fit for me. Everyone that I talk to in music has a teacher at some point who sort of inspired them. And I like that you mentioned that he was your first model of a professional musician. You know, I had several different teachers growing up, and, and I think about all of them in different ways. They all kind of give me, gave me different lessons. Um, so do you think, how, is these, how have these experiences, how have these teachers influenced what you do today? Do you, do you feel like there's a direct connection to what they taught you? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have been taught subdivision. I mean, and as stupid as that sounds, as, as that is, um, you know, I've had, I've had really good teachers and I've had really bad, bad teachers and I've learned a lot from both. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it's funny that you point to subdivision. Do you, do you feel like, do you feel that rhythm's the biggest thing, young students, young musicians, is that the biggest problem or the, the biggest I don't want to say problem. That's probably not the right word. Is that the biggest challenge, teaching rhythm? Well, I think rhythm is interesting because, in in my opinion, I know for me personally and, and for a lot of my students, rhythm is the most difficult thing to untrain the brain to learn and then reteach. Uh, you know, once you've learned, you know, in my opinion, changing notes or changing fingerings, those those are tiny things compared to uh, the the neural process that it takes to unlearn and relearn a rhythm. This is really interesting um, that you say that. I kind of want to dig into that a little bit more. And so, um, you know, when I look at young band music and we look at sort of the lists of requirements um, for each grade level, you know, very often the pitch is sort of, it's by age level, you know, certain, as you advance an instrument, you can play it, your range increases, your stamina increases, but it seems like rhythm um, takes such a long time to develop. Do you have any thoughts on maybe how we can in improve that teaching of rhythm? Well, it's interesting, you know, John Pasternak and I have talked quite a bit about this because I... I don't want to say I proof a lot of his pieces, but he runs a lot of them by me. And he's started writing for younger groups now. And it's it's really interesting to me, you know, he'll show me, you know, a grade two piece and a grade three piece. And, you know, I can, I can immediately notice a lot of the changes in, you know, instrumental ranges and things like that. You know, the difference in the rhythmic capacity is not that great. And I... You know, I, I'm not a composer. I would never, I would never claim that. Um, but it's it's interesting to me how that's kind of one of the last um, elements of music that really gets developed. Uh, yeah, I can extrapolate this out. I, I've taught um, college music theory and oral skills for 15 years, and when you look at the the curriculum and oral skills, it's it's so much of it is pitch heavy. And I realize that we have a a pitch heavy tradition in the European North American tradition 
but it takes so long to get to triplets or to subdivisions in in compound meters or to advanced rhythms or you know advanced triplets over the bar, the beats or, and so it's it's interesting that it you can sort of see it at all levels certainly okay um so tell me about your program at Hiram College what have you got going there it's a pretty tiny program. Um, I would say we've got maybe 40 music majors across the vocal and instrumental program. The total population of the college is about 1,100 students. Um, we've been very fortunate. Um, my predecessors did a lot of uh, hiring ringers for concerts, and I wanted to do away with that. Um, sure. But what I did do was treat it kind of as a community band. So if, uh, you know, community members wanted to come in and play, you know, if they were willing to um, make a significant number of the rehearsals and, you know, could play the concert, uh, that has helped uh, allow us to do some more advanced repertoire and some of the stuff that we wouldn't necessarily be able to do if we were simply using just uh, the student population. And quite frankly, um, it's, it's allowed me to expose some of the less advanced students to uh, music that we would never be capable of doing if it was just them on their own. So interesting, what percentage of the ensemble would you say is music majors versus non-music majors who are traditional students versus community members? I, I'm interested in the breakdown of that. I would say um, I have about 40 regular members, and then we add anywhere from 5 to 10 additional members for concerts, depending on what the instrumentation is. I would say maybe half of those com are community members and half of those are students. And of the student population, it's about half music major, half music, half, half sorry, half non-major. Mm -hmm. Sure. What time are your rehearsals then for the community members? Are they during the day? They are. We rehearse 4.30 to 6, uh, hang on, 4.30 to 6 Mondays and Wednesdays. I see. I see. When I was in, in college, we had lots of community members in, in one of the bands, and it was always 7 to 10 on Monday nights. Wow. And that was specifically made for that. A lot of, um, I had a very kind of an older generation teacher when I was a, an undergraduate, and he was really well connected to the, the band directors in the area, and so they all came in and played in the band. Sure. And so I sat next to, like, the, the teachers who would eventually be colleagues. Right. And so I actually, I thought that was a good experience. I, I think sometimes we look at having community members, but they bring so much different experience and perspective. Well, when I was in high school, um, in addition to my high school band, I played in the Lakeland Civic Band, which is a Sudler Silver School award-winning uh, community band. And I got to sit next to my teacher and next in a group with, you know, a lot of the band directors in the major programs uh, in the city. And, you know, it was there that I got to play pieces like Lincolnshire Posey for the first time or La Fiesta Mexicana. And... You know, that never would have happened in my high school. Um, so I really think, you know, having that kind of environment for students is really important. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I would really encourage any high school students to go play in the local community bands. I actually, I do it myself. I'm a professional composer and a college professor, and I go play in the local band because it's fun. And I get to get my hands on my instrument and some music again. Well, and I think that's so important, and I think it's important for especially young teachers to maintain the progress on their instrument. You right, know? absolutely. Even if it's not, you know, a stellar community band, I mean, there are so many groups out there that you can be a part of that, you know, no matter what your schedule is, that I'm sure you can find time to be a part of, and and staying in touch with your instrument is so important for you. Absolutely. It reminds us that it's fun. That too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let me ask you the hard question. Sure. And so this is the master question. So let's say you, that you had a concert in two weeks or some arbitrary date that's coming up very quickly, um, and I handed you a new piece of music to learn. What would your, be your priorities in teaching that piece? Uh, melody and form, I think. You know, I, I always tell, especially my private students, you know, 
the more that you can identify where patterns are and where recurring themes are, you know, the more quickly you'll be able to learn a piece. And so for me, that's, that's probably the most important thing because, you know, I, students are smart enough to know, you know, dynamics are not optional and things like that. And so I know that those things will be kind of automatically taken care of. So the, the faster that I can expose them to what the different elements are and the faster that I can kind of teach them where they need to be directing their listening, um, the faster that they'll be able to adjust and to start making music out of it rather than just trying to figure out what's going on. So what does a rehearsal look like then? Uh, usually what I do is I have handouts for my students um, that usually will have some information about the composer and about the piece, why it was written, things like that. Um, I also include uh, little snippets of the themes so that they can actually see what they are. Uh, usually I'll play, them, I'll play it for them on the piano first, and then you know we'll start actually with little passages where those themes occur. And once they kind of get them in their ear, we'll go back and read through the whole thing. And then I'll go back again to the, to the parts that we played before the reading and kind of show them where all those different kinds of things happen. That's very interesting. I, you know, I think one of the things about approaching a new piece is how do you parse it out? How do you divide it up into uh, manageable chunks so you can learn it? Sure. Okay, so do you have any hard-earned lessons some people would call them mistakes, but they're really lessons. Well, you know, there is there is no shortcutting when it comes to score study. Um, you just have to sit down and do it. It takes so much time. And, you know, the more new music that I do, the more that I am refining my process and, and what that looks like. But, you know, ultimately, you know, we, we're always, and I have students ask me this all the time, whether I'm, you know, at conducting symposia or, you know, just my own students, you know, how, how can, how can I study this better? You know, and it's, it's like, I can give you some suggestions of things to look at, but ultimately the process is very personal Mm -hmm. and the process is something that you just have to dedicate the time to. There is no shortcutting. Right. And I, so, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, why don't, why don't you talk about your process? Uh, so I do several readings, quote unquote, first, just, you know, glancing through the score to see, you know, what kinds of markings are there, you know, what kind of tempo indications, you know, what's the instrumentation like, uh, is the, is the score in C or is it a transposing score? Um, are there any interesting markings in the score, either terms or markings in the parts that I'm maybe not familiar with that I need to identify first before I go through, uh, that I go through and try and very, very slowly, you know, identify things like melody, uh, get a, a judge of the rhythmic landscape. And then I go through and I play line by line, um, part by part. And I usually do it, uh, I'm a flute player in addition to playing oboe. And uh, usually I'll go through and I'll play each line on the flute, number one, because I enjoy playing. Uh, But number two, because I think it's the fastest way for me to get a concept of how would a wind player play this. Mm -hmm. You know, what would I do if I saw this marking as a player? Right. And especially with brand new music, you know, I can, that's my quickest judge of, you know, when I go and get in touch with the composer, what are the things that I need to ask them? You know, if I can say, well, you know, looking at the markings that you put down, I would play it like this. Is that what you really intended? Um, I think that's that's the most quick way to get questions like that answered. Um, so I think playing through line by line uh, is really, really important. And then you can, you can kind of get a concept for 
you know, how do I, how do I want to shape that phrase? You know, how do I want to articulate, you know, the, the different markings that there are? Um, that's really important. And then once I kind of have those images in my head, I go back through and I, as slowly as it takes, try to assimilate as much of the score at one time as I can. And I just keep doing it at that speed until I get everything in and then I slowly ramp up the speed and then I start making decisions about shaping and style and all those things and then we've got a piece. Yeah, that's that's terrific. Thanks so much for sharing that. Sure. So you mentioned you talked about um, preparing to talk to a composer about their piece. Are you in contact with composers of, of new music? Do you call all the composers or contact them? Absolutely. I mean, it, it's so it's so important because, you know, number one, especially if it's a composer that you've never worked with before, you've never done their other works before, you know, just just having access to somebody. I mean, composers are so willing to talk about their music. <laughs> Sorry, I, I laughed there. They just no, absolutely. They just, I mean, they love talking about their music, and they love when people are interested enough and invested enough to take the time to get in touch with them to ask them about it. Absolutely. So it's it's really important, and and also you get the best information to be able to give to your students that way. Um, I've done John Pasternak's music, and I bring his name up because you've talked with him before. I've been doing his music since I was a grad student at Kent State, uh, gosh, almost 10 years ago. And so I know his music very well, but there are still parts of the process, you know, where I will ask him, you know, is this really what you want here? And, and he's always so, so happy to talk about it or, you know, to sing it or, you know, whatever I need to be able to get my question answered. He's always happy to do it. And I, and I think that's, that's composers in general. Yeah. I, I think, you know, it's the, the compositional process is very personal, but once a piece is done, we want to share it with the world. So we want to hear it. We want to talk about it. Sure. So you mentioned that it's, you like to talk to composers. You know, one of the things I'd like to talk about is that I think when I was a young teacher, oh, 20 years ago, I was a little bit maybe scared of the big name composers. I wouldn't reach out. Maybe I felt that uh, it wasn't my place. And now that I'm sort of flipped and I'm, I'm a composer myself, I, I want people to contact me. Do you have composers come to your, to your school and work with your, your students to kind of humanize them? Sure. John was actually, I had him out probably two weeks ago um, for a couple of sessions. Um, I'm premiering his third symphony um, in April next month. And so having him out to kind of explain the piece and to hear where the students were with it, um, I think is really important because he can talk about where the ideas came from in the first place. And, you know, if there's anything that I'm doing that maybe not necessarily uh, be exactly what he envisioned, you know, we can adjust that. Um, and I had him conduct an entire rehearsal with my group. Uh, he's a public school educator. And, you know, I thought it would be really important for him to have some face time with them and, and uh, you know, get to work with them and kind of shape his music uh, firsthand. Sure. Have you have you ever commissioned a composer or participated in a commission? Several. Um, not just from John. We it was just part of a consortium that uh, commissioned a work from Mark Camphaus mm -hmm. uh, that was written in memory of Bob Jorgensen, who was my teacher at Akron. Um, and in the spring of 2016, uh, I did a concert that was entirely new music. So. Uh, either, you know, pieces that we commissioned directly or that we were part of a consortium. Mm -hmm. And so what's that exp what was that experience like for you, um, the commissioning process? And let's talk about the consortium first. Sure. Um, I have never led a consortium, but I participated in probably five or six. Oh, wow. And usually it's, it's a very straightforward process. Um, usually the way that we find out about, or I find out about them anyway, is through uh, CBDNA, 
we have a listserv and we're we're in constant contact with each other so um you know anytime a conductor approaches a composer about writing a new work you know the composer says sure i'll do it for this amount and you know what do you want and once that's all negotiated uh it gets sent out to all of us and we're given the opportunity to join and once the piece is finished, we get parts and performance rights, and once the premiere's done, we get a free go, and uh, it's it's pretty straightforward. And I've been fortunate that a lot of the composers that I've worked with have all done this kind of thing before. So you know they're used to the contracting process and you know all of the kind of legalities behind putting something like to, this together. So. I haven't really run into too many snags uh, up to this point. Mm -hmm. And so obviously the value of a consortium is that you split the costs among different groups. Have you done a solo co uh, solo commission? I have. Um, this symphony that John is writing, we did another piece of his last year. And at the end of the concert, we, were, we went out uh, to have dinner afterward. And he said, you know, I wanted to write this piece. You know, I've had this kind of uh, idea to write a piece based on speeches of JFK, but I don't know what it would look like. And I said, you know, if you write it, I'll do it. Um, and it was another one of those things that's just kind of snowballed. And sure. I, I didn't expect it to be finished so quickly, but we kind of collaborated on it. I mean... All the way through the process, John was sending me drafts and, you know, what do you think about this and, you know, the different speeches. And so it, it was really an interesting work. And I guess it's it's different when you're collaborating with friends and colleagues as it would be if I were to just reach out to somebody I didn't really know that well. Um, but I would imagine that the process would be similar. Sure. And and so how do you feel, what do you think the students are, are get from the commissions and the consortiums? Well, you know, I think, I think there's a lot of value in playing music that was written by somebody that they can actually go and talk to, uh, somebody who can make themselves available, uh, as opposed to, you know, doing orchestral transcriptions that have been over and over again, or, you know, doing some of the band literature that is, um, you know, worth doing, but I think, I think there's kind of a, an element removed when they don't get the first-hand contact. You know, my students right. are really excited to get, get to be able to work with him. And for that matter, too, so are the community members. A lot of them are public school teachers, and I think John has gotten one or two additional commissions just from players who have been in my groups who've been able to interact with them. And I think I think that that part of the process can't be overlooked. Sure. All right. I, this this kind of makes me think about another question. Um, how do you what are you looking for in a piece of music as a conductor at, at the level at the, the liberal arts college level? What are you looking for when you program a piece? I, you know, it's uh, I. I always am interested in somebody who can write a good melody. I think, you know, there are too many people writing music who are looking at the grade level qualifications. What does this piece need to be, instead of letting a piece develop organically? And I think one of the things that really stands out to me is a good melody. Um, also, composers who are able to use interesting colors. One of the great things that I love about working with wind ensembles is the color palette that's available is just so deep and rich. And composers who are really able to utilize that get my attention. Uh, composers who are always coming up with new sounds, not not necessarily just you know for the sake of creating sound, but but different color combinations. Um, I was at Northwestern University a couple of weeks ago, and they were doing a new piece by Joel Puckett, uh -huh. and I was in the rehearsal, 
And I found myself kind of sitting on the edge of my seat so many times trying to identify what it was that I was hearing because I, I could see who was playing and I could see what was going on. But the, the sounds that I was getting were so unexpected. It, it really had me interested the entire time. And I think, I think those things for me are what really make composers and their work stand out, stand out to me. Sure. Okay, Matt, so you mentioned Joel Puckett's music and, and New Colors. I, I think there's maybe a fear among some some school directors of new music. I think there's a sort of a, a, a mystique or an aura that comes with that. So uh, what, what would you say about accessibility? Well, I think, I think a couple of things. Um, the first thing is you, it, it never hurts to expose your students. You know, nothing bad will happen if... You know, I mean, I'm doing a reading with my community band, uh, Lincolnshire Posey, in two weeks. Not because we're going to play it, but it's such a cornerstone work that I think they're finally playing at a level where they will be able to take something away just from doing a session on it. Um, you know, and, and so what if you don't have, you know, a decent baritone player? Read it anyway, you know? Um, just because, you know, a lot of, you know, so-and-so's music is above the level where your band is capable of playing, you know, they can at least be exposed to it. And quite frankly, as a musician, I think, and, and conductor, I think you need to be studying those kinds of scores. You know, you need to be familiar with what's out there, um, and it helps you stay current. Sure. Sure. All right. So what's your favorite work for wind ensemble? You know, I agonized about this question. (laughs) Um, It's such a hard, you know, and I thought, well, do I go with something new or do I go with a cornerstone? You know, what's, what's a good answer? And I, you know, I kept coming back to one piece and that's David Maslanka's child's garden of dreams. Oh yeah. I just, there is something about that piece that I just, gravitate so strongly toward and it's I mean it's got everything it's got the virtuosity it's got the different colors and it's got it's got such a great background behind it and and David is just so great at taking really simple melodies and simple harmonic structures and turning them into these really really great landscapes yeah I I I David's music is incredible. He's such a talented and gracious man. Um, I, I'm going to give a shout out. I often give a shout out to Garrett Hope. He runs a podcast called The Portfolio Composer. And he actually just interviewed David a few weeks ago. And it's a terrific listen for anyone who's um, who wants to listen to that. Fantastic. And one of, the, one of the questions that Garrett asks on his podcast, which I have stolen because it's such a good question, is what advice would you give to your 20-year-old self? Oh my gosh. You know, I was in such a hurry and I have no idea why. Um, I graduated in three years and I did my master's in a year and a half. And looking back now, there was a lot of stuff that I just totally blew through and, and not from a, from a studying standpoint or from an academic standpoint, but you know, I was very fortunate to have gone to school at a place where a lot of the major teachers in Cleveland were working at. And, you know, just, you know, to be able to, you know, go sit in a trombone lesson with Ed Zdrozny just because I could, you know, there are so many opportunities like that that I wish I would have taken had I known what I had in front of me. So, you know, take the opportunity to do absolutely anything because you never know, number one, what you'll take away from the experience and number two, when you're going to need it. Absolutely. I I look back at my undergraduate and I was so fortunate to be able to do a variety of different things that have enriched my musical life. I think that's just such great advice. Okay. Is there anything coming up that you'd like to sh- share or promote? Oh, gosh. Um... 
we're doing the premiere of John's Symphony on April 5th. Uh, it's a free concert at Hiram College. The University Heights Band uh, does a summer series that's, uh, that spans June and July. We do a lot of free concerts all across the city of Cleveland, so that'll be coming up. Um, I think that's it in the immediate future for me, though. Okay, I'll look up. I'll, I'll make sure I put links to the band. And on the, is there a website for the band? There is indeed. I'll make sure I link it in the show notes. Um, how do, how will people get in touch with you if they want to talk to you? Uh, you can go through my website, matthewsalagio.com. Uh, there are social media links there, and there's a contact page so that you know if you want to get in touch with me, ask me anything, you know, uh, advice, you know, whatever you need, you can get in touch with me there. Great, thanks, Matt. Um, it, last chance. Is there anything you'd like to add just at the end here? You know, I, I really can't stress enough doing anything that you can get your hands on. You know, if you have an opportunity while you're in school to go play opera, go do it. Even if you don't like opera, because the experience of playing in an opera orchestra or, you know, even be able, being able to watch a rehearsal is so important to what we do elsewhere. And that's, you know, of course, just one example. Um, but even after you're out in the field, doing things like that is so important. And I think the value that it brings for your students is is invaluable, I mean, really. And the other thing is study scores. Study scores of stuff that you're not even gonna conduct because it's just so important to be as familiar with lots of different stuff as you possibly can. You know, study study the stuff that's way beyond where your band is. Study orchestral scores, study opera, study, you know, I mean, study it all because the more well-rounded you are, the better you are as a resource for your students. Great. Matthew, thank you so much for, for the interview today. I really appreciate your time and your wisdom and your advice. Thanks so much. Happy to do it. Thanks, Mark.